Uh, welcome, everybody. We are now in the speed talk session of the Northwest University's Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management Conference. For this, the theme of this conference is the role that the Unit for Environmental, the role that Environmental Sciences and Management have on the Fourth Industrial Revolution. For this, we are going to have very short talks, five minutes, three minutes speed talk, and two minutes for questions. And we'll jump right into it. So first up is Sue Ann Bosch, and she will be talking to us about zebrafish and quantum dots. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So for those of you who don't know the term nanoparticle, this is a particle between 1 and 100 nanometers in size. These particles are used for a wide variety of um, consumer products as well as things like bioimaging. These particles are also not regulated regarding the release of the particles into the environment. So this is important for their to, to know their toxicity as well. So their size, shape, agglomeration patterns, as well as functional groups attached to these particles can influence their possible toxicity in the environment. So for my study, I focused on three different kinds of cadmium terillium quantum dots assessing their toxicity. So each of the different quantum dots had the same cadmium terillium core, but were functionalized with three different um, functional chains, like a lollipop with a stick. So <laughs> um, when we looked at characterization of the particles in the exposure media we used, we saw that as the concentrations of the particles in the media increased, so did the agglomeration of the patterns, meaning larger particles settling out at higher concentrations. We also saw that the particles with the NH3 functional group had the smallest particle size, but had the largest agglomeration patterns. Then we look at the two top graphs, which indicate um, metal concentrations within the exposure media for each of the particles, as well as metal concentration um, in, within the organisms after 96 hours of exposure. These two graphs basically indicate that the NH3 functionalized particles had the lowest metal content available in the stock solution, but then had the highest content when the organism, in, within the organism after exposure. The NH3 group also had the same concentration as the pe pegulated particles um, at the highest concentration, indicating that the NH3 particles were taken up more readily by the organism than the pegulated particles. We also saw that um, the lower concentrations were more toxic to the organism than the higher concentrations. Um, then we saw the opposite when looking at respiration. We saw the highest concentration affecting respiration more than the lower concentrations. This is most likely due to particles agglomerating at this high concentration, settling out, covering the chorion of the organism, preventing res respiration through the pores of the zebrafish. We also looked at physical deformities, which also indicated the lower concentrations being much higher, uh, being much more toxic than the higher concentrations with more edemas and spinal deformations. We also saw that uh, regardless of the metal content, um, spinal deformations were more um, prevalent within the NH3 group, indicating this is a particle-specific response and not necessarily a response due to metal, which is a novel finding. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sue Ann. Are there any questions? Sue Ann, in a case like this, would you expect all metal nanomaterials to be happy? behave the same way, or would you expect different? No, so like I said in my quick introduction, um, the size affects the uptake, the shape affects the uptake, um, the media you use also affects the uptake, so the pH of the media and things like that can cause um, different metals within the particles to react differently and maybe um, dissolute from the particle where others do not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next up we have William Dembu, and he's going to tell us about tick control. Once more, good morning. My name is William Zemo, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, tick chemical control practices in uh, communal farming areas of the Oral Chambo district of South Africa. This is a baby born from uh, my PhD thesis titled Characterization of Acaricide Resistance of Ticks on Cattle um, in Communal Farming Areas of the Eastern Cape, which in which we had objectives to, us to look at um, the identify first the risk factors associated with acaricide resistance uh, on ticks of, on cattle, as well as determine the, the acaricide resistance status of the ticks, and try to elucidate the, the underlying uh, genetic mechanisms that uh, that lead to tick acaricide resistance. So, hence this is just one of uh, from here. This title is coined from the first objective. Here, why OR Tambo District? The Oral Tambo district of South Africa, hence you know it's found in the Transkai, where the, the resource poor farmers they depend more on livestock production. And that area has the highest livestock production in South Africa with uh, approximately 900 to, 900 to 1 million thousand cattle. 900,000 to, to 1 million cattle population. And, and the the, the Production potential of uh, cattle is challenged by the devastating effects of ticks, tick-borne diseases, as well as the tick acaricide failure. So to obtain um, an understanding of the possible uh, effects, factors that lead to tick acaricide failure, we looked at um, all the deep tanks in the area, which there are about 400 of them, and purposively selected about 94 of them to carry out our study based on uh, reported acaricide resistance and as well as um, uh, the number of cattle in that particular deep tank stations, which would be more than around 500 cattle in number. So um, a semi-structured questionnaire was administered to the, farm, to the farmers when there was a dipping time, uh, during the, the dipping times, and... Um, to collect on-farm on use of acaricide as well as uh, the, the, the practices that, that may affect the, the, the acaricide usage. So um, to summarize what the data, that the, the results that we had, we, we, we observed that the farmers believe that um, the weak acaricide mixture, poor deep, deep tank of state of the, the poor state of the deep tank, and missing deep dates uh, account for the acaricide resistance. But when we observed the, the factors that were associated with the acaricide failure, we saw that cattle breed accounted to acaricide resistance. They used, the acaricide used, because there's a lack of uh, acaricide rotation, as well as low concentration of diluted acaricide in the deep tank, as well as interaction between the treated and untreated animals, as well as farmers missing dipping dates for the, the immersion of cattle as uh, the underlying factors that could lead to acaricide resistance. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? Anybody at home? <laughs> Um, is there any way that this can be applied, so with the study that you've done, applied to try and increase um, educational practices within farming? Now, it is hoped that um, information from these results will, will be able to guide and inform tick control as well as uh, guide the management of acaricide resistance. So that is when we finish the results, we were able to give uh, the results to the veterinary services to be able to for them to use to control acaricide resistance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Mr. Fortunate uh, Farka, and he's going to tell us about herpeto fauna in South Africa. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Chair, and a good morning to everyone. So um, this is um, my study, and that, um, that, that title is just a fancy way of saying that I'm studying the relationship between South African cultures and frogs and reptiles to see how we can improve um, conservation policy while also including people in um, wildlife matters. So um, a brief background on wh wh where this um, thinking came about is um, somewhere, sometime long ago, around the 1800s, um, oh, sorry, um, over there, um, Darwin had a similar idea, but his peers ridiculed him. They probably th thought he had a, a bit too much ale, so he gave up the idea. And when you fast forward to the 1990s, um, this is when curiosity between curiosity about the link between culture and wildlife um, reached its highest peak. And this is when researchers started um, dedicating their projects to this field. And also, this is when the term biocultural diversity um, was coined, and it was defined as the complex link between culture and wildlife. Now, when you move over to um, the 21st century, this is when this research field got the stamp of approval, um, got verified. This is when the scientific community said environmental systems and social systems, which include um, cultural systems, are inseparable. Uh, now that brings me to the, my PhD, which is looking at biocultural diversity within the South African context. And one of the few things that I'm looking at is folk taxonomy and cultural, um, cultural ecological knowledge. Uh, on the folk taxonomy part, we looked at um, cultural ways of looking at, uh, cultural ways of naming frogs, and we compared it to the scientific way of naming frogs. And we found so many similarities that we took the cultural way of naming frogs and submitted for peer review. It got approved. And now what we're doing is we're coming up with South Africa's um, first comprehensive list of indigenous names for frogs. Once we're done with the frogs, moving over to the reptiles. When I say indigenous names, I mean names in all the, the languages for each and every frog and reptile species we have in the country. Um, also looked at uh, the past 28 years of biocultural research in South Africa, and what we found was that a lot of it is biased towards plants, which makes sense because they are medicinal and there's um, many money to be made there, and they're also centered around four of the nine provinces. So now going forward, I need to um, have a more balanced look at our provinces and also in increase um, the representation of animals, specifically frogs and reptiles, in this biocultural diversity um, research. And that's where I end. Thank you. Hi, are there any questions? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, can you just wait for the mic so that they can hear? Give us one South African frog name. One South African frog name. Uh, in, um, can I just give you the most complex? Well, I'll try to find the easiest one. Um, in Kunzi, a clock. Um, that is the giant bullfrog. And this is a name that we found, that we got from the Zulu speaking people in the Zululand region. Um, thank you for your presentation. So, so, why would you think is it important that we have um, common names in the different languages in South Africa? Um, for, for mostly for research purposes and conservation purposes, um, there are, just an example, there's more than um, five species of reed frogs, but there's only one that's critically endangered. So when you go to Zulu-speaking people and you want, to, you want them to help you with conserving these species, you'll think that you're speaking about the specific frog, while to them, you're speaking about five frogs. So if you have a specific name, then it's easier for conservation purposes. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Ms. Tanya Foshia, and she will be speaking about fungal toxins in soil ecosystems. Soil, considered by most as uh, mere dirt, but actually, 
a very important natural resource on which we depend for so much. For example, food security, a quarter of the planet's biodiversity, the mitigation of poverty, and even uh, climate change. But the quality of soil continued to deteriorate at a staggering rate each year. Changes in temperatures and soil moisture affect the physical, chemical, and biological processes in soil, and can also affect the quality and productivity for our soil, not just in terms of food production, but also in terms of the pathogens, pests, and natural toxins that cause harm. Now, aflatoxin is one such an example. It is a natural toxin produced by soil fungi um, when the fungi is exposed to stress conditions, and specifically drought conditions. It is one of the most prevalent threats to food safety and human health um, because of its toxicity and cancer-causing properties. However, it's not currently considered as causing any long-term environmental risks because it has the ability to absorb to soil and be degraded by soil microbes. But what happens to the aflatoxins once it's absorbed and transformed? Now, in the first phase of my study, I looked at environmental uh, literature, looking at the uh, environmental consequences of aflatoxin with specific emphasis on soil. And I will share three of the most important findings. Firstly, m recent studies have shown that um, changing temperatures and um, climate conditions will significantly increase the risk of aflatoxin formation by fungi in areas where it already occurs, but also widen its geographical distribution. Secondly, current regulations provide minimal options for food and crops to be disposed of once they're contaminated. The only two options given is either incineration or to work it back into the soil. Now, this form of toxin loading into our soil could potentially um, cause or change the physical chemical balance in our soil. Then thirdly, once it, the toxin's in the soil, we know that plants, or some plants have the ability to reabsorb it, and birds and insects that feed on this plant material can be affected in terms of their developmental rate and their fit, physical fitness. However, we don't know yet what it does to our soil organisms that provide important services. So to conclude, the risk of aflatoxin and its breakdown products remain an important area of research for soil health. And in the next phase of my study, I will investigate these risks under different temperatures and moisture conditions um, using earthworms as bioindicators of soil health. I thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, so why are you selecting earthworms specifically and not another type of bioindicator in the soil system? All right. So earthworms are considered as very good bioindicators because they are widespread um, and they are also good indicators of what happens in soil. Um, other species like nematodes can also be used, but earthworms are very good surrogates of soil health, and that is why we will use it. Thank you. Okay, next up, we're going to have a talk from, by Mr. Eric Smith, and we will hear about environmental accountability, something which is very important if you have all the science and no accountability. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Eric Smith. I'm working for the Auditor General of South Africa for the past 33 years. Uh, yes, that's why I look so old. Um, I, th I think you will bear with me. Uh, my thesis today is about, or what I want to share with you today, is enhancing environmental accountability through public sector auditing. And my focus will be on a South African perspective. But before I start this presentation with you, I just want to share uh, a quote with you, and also just a heading from an article that I read that will also put my research in perspective. The first one is from Steve Nichols, and Steve Nichols said, accountants to save the world. Hallelujah for me. Uh, and then also, Wangarei Matai, I'm sure you know about her. Uh, she's from Kenya. It's also environmentalist from Kenya that said, 
I'm not only working to protect the environment, I'm also working to improve governance. And that is where I want to go with my research. What I'm going to share with you today is just briefly of what am I doing, why am I doing it, and then also the significance thereof, and then I also want to share with you how I did it and a few of the preliminary results as it is still in, in process. The question that actually started this research or my interest in this research was what is the best placement for environmental matter or environmental risks and issues uh, within the public sector audit methodology processes of South Africa? Does it fit better with your voluntary uh, performance audit processes? In other words, where we focus on the three E's, economy, efficiency, and effectiveness? Or should we rather put it under regularity where we look at your financial and compliance issues? In our office, there's also uh, special investigations and also priority audits, but that is more on a, on a needs basis that we look at that. What do I want to achieve with this study? I want to interrogate the best placement of environmental issues and risks within the audit methodology processes of the Auditor General. The approach that I followed is I start global, and as they say, and then I act local. In other words, I first look at global trend. What is Intusai doing? If I talk about Intusai, it's the International Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions, where are they in this process? And then I wanted to take it to a South African perspective. Um, how I did it is I looked at, at um, I did some critical analysis uh, on the surveys, the Working Group of Environmental Auditing Surveys, interviews, uh, survey questionnaires, etc., etc. My preliminary results, I think you will also see there on the slide, currently indicates that performance audit is the best placement or you know, the people that participated in the process, they want it under performance audit. But both of the uh, regularity and performance have some significant uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes? Uh, this will, will be a personal point of view, but I think the carrot is not working anymore. Um, so, yes, I think from an audit perspective and being involved in these audits now for, for the 33 years uh, in all uh, methodology processes, I think it's time now that we should take a bit of action because uh, uh, the carrot is definitely not working anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next up, Henu Hafenga is going to tell us about storms in the high felt. So anyone who's from there loves a good storm. I present you with a stage, a battle of sorts between light and dark, yin and yang, the greatest show on earth. It's November and summer has commenced. The sun rises over the high felt. It's a warm morning and the sky is blue, blue as only the African sky can be. The air is calm, the atmosphere is stable. A farmer looks in the distance. He can sense what's coming. He sensed it before. He says a prayer and starts his day, hoping to be spared. In Joburg, a businessman sits in traffic. It's eight in the morning, and the, radio, the weather report comes on the radio. The South African Weather Service has issued a warning. Thunderstorms are expected in the afternoon with a high chance of lightning, hail, and flash floods. He looks at the blue sky and forgets it. The day passes. It's five in the afternoon. Wind and rainfall shake the farmhouse. The thunder is deafening. Within 20 minutes, the storm has passed. This time, the farmer was spared. Good rains for the field, he thinks. The storm reaches Johannesburg at 6 o'clock. It's rush hour. The storm grows. Rainfall gushes on the paved roads with nowhere to go. Go, 
the water rises rapidly, large hail begins to fall, no structure is spared. Our businessman can't leave the office. The city is in chaos. Ladies and gentlemen, what I just described is a common occurrence over the South African eye felt. Thunderstorms are our lifeblood, but they can also be life takers. Human induced pollution can act as droplet and ice nuclei, accelerating or inhibiting particle growth. Along with this, we have changed the land surface properties, which also impact convective processes, the warm air rising and feeding these storms. Research has shown that an area as small as eight square kilometers can have an impact on thunderstorm formation. From radar data that are analyzed, we can see that Johannesburg has a higher concentration of ice and droplets than that of the surrounding rural area. This is indicated by maximum radar reflectivity, DBZ. Clearly, we have changed the atmospheric properties over cities, maybe even increasing the severity of thunderstorms. I hope to better understand our spatial temporal impacts on the microphysical and dynamical properties of thunderstorm clouds. This will allow us to give our farmer and businessman a better forecast. But we need better aerosol, microphysical, land surface, and observational data. This could allow us to focus our resources at more precise locations, possibly saving more lives. Ladies and gentlemen, when you leave this room, look up and marvel at the greatest theater on Earth, always there for your viewing pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Um, thanks for the nice presentation. Um, I was just wondering, especially in the high fell, that's my sampling mm. area as well, um, do you think that conventional versus conservation agriculture, for example, because that changes the um, surface um, microbiota and so on, does yeah. that have an effect on thunderstorms occurring over a certain conservation or conventional um, agriculture practice for a farmer? Yeah, so would you have different forecasts for a farmer using a different con um, a tillage method or so on, for example? So it definitely affects the atmosphere. If we're able to forecast, it is a different problem. Because what you have to understand is that the storms we're talking about are small, sometimes less than one square kilometer. You can have an uh, isolated thunderstorm. So yeah, on a small scale, an individual farmer's piece of land might have an impact on the cloud. But we aren't at the stage, even with the best high-resolution numerical weather models, to actually tell a farmer, like, hey, on that piece of land, it's going to rain today. And because your land use looks like this, this is what's going to happen to the storm. So the impact is there, but we, we don't fully understand it yet. And we, can't, we definitely can't forecast it yet. And so that's what we're trying to do by characterizing the differences between um, rural and, and um, urban areas, because we know that the microphysical impacts of, of um, cloud condensation nuclei and ice nuclei have an impact on these storms. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Divan van Royen, and he's going to tell us about the Pongola floodplain. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So today I'll be giving you a quick uh, three-minute thesis presentation on the role of the nearby Usutu River in maintaining floodplain plans in the Pong lower Pongala floodplain in northern KwaZulu-Natal. So the Inyamiti plan, so in the Inyamiti plan, which is a natural saline plan, is situated in uh, Ndumu Game Reserve in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Which, uh, uh, which has its own unique water chemistry due to the underlying Cretaceous marine sediment-based uh, geology. So historically, it receives its water from a small localized catchment, as well as through flooding from the Usutu and the Pongola River. But due to an extended drought in the region, um, due to an extended drought in the region, there has been no floods, uh, flood releases from Lake Pongola Port, which is situated. Um, on the Pongola River upstream of the game reserve. 
and that has resulted in a near desiccation of a, the Nyamiti pan on a few occasions. So the aim of the study was to, uh, to determine whether the natural flooding regime of the Asutu River um, has an impact on the water chemistry of the Nyamiti pan. So water, water was sampled from both, uh, both rivers as well as the, the two uh, largest uh, pans in the, in the game reserve um, and was analyzed for water nutrients as well as for salt concentrations. Maucha diagrams were used to, uh, to analyze the water chemistry of uh, both rivers as well as their respective pans that they flood. Uh, so Maucha diagrams were, was used uh, to summarize the major ions in, in a water sample uh, in a rapid way to allow for a comparison between two water samples. So the arrows that you see here from the rivers to the, to the pan is just an indication to um, the influence that the rivers has on the pan and uh, how they flood the pan. So the rivers and the respective uh, floodplain pans uh, revealed similar chemical characteristics where the Malcher diagrams between the two rivers indicated that um, they water chemistry are dis uh, dissimilar. Whereas when you look at the Sutu River and its associated floodplain pan, um, the water chemistry is uh, similar, indicating the influence that it has on the pan. So with the Nyamitian question, although it receives its water from a localized catchment as well as through back flooding from the Pongola and the uh, Usutu River, um, the water chemistry is totally different. Um, and irrespective of the individual water chemistries from both rivers, uh, the phosphorus mar marine rock uh, basal formation from the Makitini uh, flats uh, dominated the water chemistry of the Nyamiti pan, which will ensure that it would retain its uh, unique water chemistry. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Divan. Are there any questions regarding the flood plan? There? Um, thank you, Divan. So, Divan, what is the importance of Nyamiti Pan within the Ndumu Game Reserve? So, it is the it is the largest um, pan inside the reserve. So, especially in terms of the 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 communities surrounding the, the game reserve, they totally reliant on the pan itself, especially with the fishing um, as well. Um, and uh, the, 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 the community, yeah. Yeah, sorry, bro. <laughs> this is what happens when someone who knows your study asks a question. Um, next up, we have uh, Zinia Houston, and she's going to tell us about teaching learning in spatial science. If students can't learn the way we think or the way we teach, we should teach the way they learn. This statement is essentially the crux of my PhD, but for, in order for it to make complete sense, I should probably first mention two things. Cities and towns make up the built environments where we live, where we work, and in the case of PhD students, even where we learn. Spatial planners are instrumental in developing these built environments, but that's not just my biased opinion. The Government Gazette of June 2018 actually includes spatial planning as one of the top 100 sought-after occupations. And the GIPSA report uh, lists planning as one of the top five priority scarce skills. Planning in its nature is dynamic, it's complex, and it's constantly changing. It started out as a statutory tool, but over time it has developed into an applied science, transdisciplinary in nature, and that needs to address a multitude of challenges we face in our surroundings. The second important thing to mention is that students currently filling university classrooms are an entirely new generation. They were born between 1995 and 2015. This means they have never heard the internet dial-up tone, and they also have no idea what a floppy disk looks like. Collectively, they are known as Generation Z, but they are also referred to as NetGen, GenTech, Digital Natives, and probably most fitting, the I generation. So taking into account the importance of spatial planning and this new generation of students, 
planning educators need to be considered as extremely important, since they are the one they are the ones that are tasked with educating Gen Z students in the paradigm of an applied science and in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. Spatial planning educators need to equip these students to proactively plan for the future, to address any challenges and to solve problems that may arise. So by using both qualitative and quantitative methods, I seek to explore the changing planning environment as well as the changing student by investigating which how knowledge is transferred from educator to student and to reflect on which methods of knowledge transfer are most preferable by this new generation. With this study, I sincerely hope to produce new knowledge within the spatial planning profession uh, relating to the education and training of planners, as well as to construct a framework for teaching planning from a, from a social constructivism perspective to hopefully aid planning educators to teach the way their students learn. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Could you please elaborate on the choice of social constructivism as a theory to base your research on? Uh, so our statutory council, which is SACPLAN, the South African Council for Planners, in terms of their guidance that they provide, spatial planning educators, they actually call for experiential learning as a method of instruction and experiential learning falls under the bigger umbrella of social constructivism. But obviously, three minutes limits my time, so I just put social constructivism in. Thank you. Okay, we still have one minute left, so. <laughs> <laughs> what is your opinion on using tools such as Google Earth in terms of planning? Uh, I think it's essential. Um, I think there's much more exploration to do in terms of technology such as Google Earth. Um, especially in using virtual reality, maybe as a community participation tool. Um, I think maybe that uh, tertiary institutions in, uh, maybe to generalize in Africa in general, are maybe a bit behind, but with the fourth industrial revolution, we have some catching up to do, which should be interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Clement Kalonga and he's going to tell us about sustainable development frameworks. I'm Clement Kalonga and uh, my research is trying to reflect on the complexity of the human needs. You know, with climate change and disasters, uh, it's no longer about addressing poverty or achieving economic growth. The human needs have become more complex and um, there are three underpinning concepts that uh, come to, to, to my research um, is um, firstly policy coherence and sustainable development and then resilience. And I'll just try to unpack them. So policy coherence is about trying to achieve policy impact without um, making policies affect each other negatively. And also it's about being able to monitor um, uh, policies effectively and it's about policy harmonization. It's a concept that has, is, is very new. It's evolved through the countries in the EU, and it's in the EU treaty in 1992. And it's, it's, it's a little bit of a new concept. It's been really limitedly applied in Africa and other parts of the world. The next concept is sustainable development. I'm not, I'm not going into too much details, but literature talks about harmonizing the environment and the ecology with social and economic needs of people. And the third and critical concept is resilience, which is now looking at disaster risk management in the broadest sense, but also looking at climate change management. Other literature talk about adaptation only, but there's literature that suggests that in resilience, you should also look at mitigation issues and also humanitarian preparedness and response. So those are the three key concepts that um, the research underpins. Now, there are three frameworks that are critical to this research in, in terms of the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement on climate change and the Sendai framework on climate change. Now, also, there are three critical approaches to policy coherence. Literature talks about those three um, uh, that, 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 that I've, I've just shown here. One is to measure political commitment to policies. And then also the, fixed, the second thing is about how are these policies being coordinated in terms of implementation and then the ability to monitor the impact of this process. So this research, the approach is being, um, um, which is being used is, is, is that approach. And there are three levels of the research because of the nature of the research is about one, appreciating the global um, uh, context in, in which the nexus of sustainable development, resilience and policy coherence exists. So to do that, the first stage of the research, the theoretical grounding, is looking at two research papers. 
One, which is looking at the conceptual understanding of these concepts and how they are being applied globally. And then the second aspect is looking at case studies. How is policy coherence, sustainable development, and resilience being applied? The second stage of the research is looking at two critical papers. One is about establishing the evidence of policy coherence, sustainable development, and resilience. And the second thing is about the relevance and applying this relevance, especially in the SADC region. And the last aspect of this research is to propose a framework and hopefully that governments in the SADC region and international organizations can start using this framework to then harmonize the way they deliver development, to avoid what happened with the Millennium Development Goals where there was less impact of the various policies that global partners and governments committed to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, in the global sense of sustainable development and the frameworks that you want to use, how do we compare? Because generally we adopt another first world country's framework. Um, in terms of this, how do we differ from that? Yeah, I think um, the beauty about the global frameworks first is to say that we... The, the beauty about global frameworks is that if everyone then pursues their own way of achieving development, then there's no global comparability. So if you're addressing environmental sustainability, and I am doing the same, and there's no global framework that guides country X and B, then there's no ability to compare what you're achieving, whether it's the same as I'm achieving. So they are very important, but you're right that at the end of the day, there are so many of them. Mm -hmm. 17 goals in one, sustainable development goals, and then you have the Paris Agreement with many provisions. You have a whole lot of uh, multilateral environmental agreements. So they become so numerous to the point that for governments that are poor and have less capacity, it's, it's, a, it's an enormous task to implement all these agreements. That's why the coherence approach is now about to say, what can we do practically? And if we choose a set of policies or tools that we want to adopt from the global frameworks, how do we do this effectively by co combining the resources together and ensuring that one policy doesn't affect the other? So that's how the comparison comes in. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up we have um, Piriti Seboklane, and she's going to talk to us about bush control, and you will know immediately that it's her when she comes up here. Into the topic, it's already been um, it's already been discussed. But bush encroachment basically decreases the grass productivity, and not only that, but it leads to the loss in biodiversity. The loss in grazing capacity negatively influences the socioeconomics of the rural people using the land for livestock production. Now, the beauty of this project, or the significance of this project, was this: brush packing, basically using the problem to solve. The problem. A simple definition of brush packing is the implementation of placing um, spiky woody branches of woody branches on areas that have been degraded where bush encroachment control has been removed. Now, the beauty of this project basically was to implement and to teach the community how to better restore their own environment by using what they already have. This project was subdivided into two important parts. One was to, to implement and to assess the implementation of brush packing as a restoration technology in order to improve the, social, the ecosystem services of the community. Not only that, but to document the socioeconomic influences of brush, this restoration brush packing before and after the um, control of bush encroachment. Now for the results. To our surprise, brush packing proved to be quite successful in the sense that the above ground grass biomass increased from 2018 to 2019 in all of the plots where brush packing had been applied. Not only that, but the people who were interviewed, which were the people who were involved with the project from the beginning, throughout the entire project, up until the end, had a positive attitude towards this project. And it was important because they were engaged from the beginning, and it created an incentive for them as job creation, impartation of skills, 
and knowledge. Now to our conclusion. And what was impressive was a total of 88, sorry about that, a total of 88% of the participants that were involved in this project after we were done with it were very, were very acknowledging of the benefits of taking part in bush control. So what the conclusion to this is, brush packing could easily be used in any rural community in order to restore the ecosystem functions. Not only this, but it's cost effective and it's easy to implement. I believe the success of this project basically when we were done was there was a significant increase of grazing capacity, a significant increase of biomass, for fodder production. And this in itself could be possibly be the solution in the rural communities in order to restore the, um, the environment. Not only that, but also to improve the socioeconomic of any community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions? I think it's great and wonderful. Just one worry. The way I'm looking at that, you had to destroy a tree to cover a ground. Okay. Um, let me explain, because we had only a limited time, let me explain the full scope of the project. So basically, the, what happens, first of all, was this project is in combination with the DEA. So what the DEA does is they identified areas where bush control was actually a problem in the community. So what happens was the first phase of the community where there's a designate, designated area where bush clearing had to be taken off, what happens was bush, the community were trained on how to remove the, the, the trees. After they removed the trees, what happens is another team came in where the herbicides was, were applied into that same area, and another team of the community were, came in where we used the branches to, to put onto the plots so that we can allow the grass to grow without the cattle coming in and eating the grass. So basically what we wanted to do was, it's not only enough to come in and cut off all the tree and leave the area bare as it is. What is it that we can do to make sure that the area after we have cut down the tree is rehabilitated and restored? So that was the crux and the beauty of using brush packing. That after we had used the brush packing, what we realized was when the land is left without any disturbances, the grass quickly began to grow up again. So you, you, remove, the, you remove the trees and you do something with the land. And that was also beneficial for the people who were using the land as well because now their livestock is able to graze. And they can also continue with the project after we've left. Every other week we call them, and what they do is they've started to do it in other areas as well, and they're seeing the improvement. So I believe that's the beauty of any research. After I'm done, what is it that can still be done by the community to sustain what we do, instead of just leaving them and me graduating and getting my PhD? <laughs> yes. Awesome, thank you so much, Purity. Very inspiring talk, don't forget your. <laughs> okay, next up we have Carly Steenkamp and she's gonna tell us about environmental impact assessments. Can you hear me? <laughs> is, it, is it on? Okay. Okay, sorry. So I'll just start from the beginning again. <laughs> um, disruption is nothing new. It's a part <laughs> of our everyday life. <laughs> as you've just witnessed. <laughs> um, in my lifetime alone, I've experienced many disruptions, from Microsoft Windows, cell phones, 
to 3D printing. Change is a constant in our lives, but we are now facing rapid changes. Environmental impact assessment is a predictive tool that is used to anticipate potential negative and positive impacts associated with change or disruptions, if you will. Now, disruptions is not necessarily a bad thing, as the word would suggest. These so-called disruptive industries cause dramatic changes that are driven by innovation. These new industries will play a major role in growing the economy and improving human life. It's therefore necessary for us to reflect on what EIA is achieving, in other words, its effectiveness, and that is basically the objective for my research. Numerous dimensions of effectiveness has been conceptualized. I will look at procedural, the actual pra um, practices, substantive, the influence that EIA has on decision making and the mitigation of negative impacts, transactive, looking at the temporal and financial costs, and then lastly, the legitimacy of the process. So considering this multidimensional nature of EIA effectiveness, what lessons can we learn from renewable energy as a disruptive industry? In South Africa, we have seen an impressive growth of renewable energy in recent years. So we therefore argue that there's valuable lessons to be learned from this industry. These include, one, we need to embrace change and move beyond the familiar. In other words, legal compliance and just checking the boxes. We need a stronger focus on international best practice and discretionary decision making. Two, EIA will need to deal with inherent uncertainties. We need a clear vision of exactly what is acceptable, early involvement of impact assessment and stakeholders. And then three, the need for efficiency has never been greater. We need to re reduce green tape without compromising quality, um, build skills and ma maximize the use of existing information. So in conclusion, the current evaluation of EIA effectiveness is limited. We need a more thoughtful, in-depth analysis that spans across multiple dimensions of effectiveness. And there are certain key ingredients, as you can see in the last um, um, illustration, that will ensure not only the effectiveness of the EIA process, but also its legitimacy. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Are there any questions? The back. Thank you, Kartli. So you've talked mm -hmm. about renewable energy as a disruptive industry, but what other industries could your research potentially uh, inform? Um, yeah, so I think the point that I'm trying to make is that disruption is here and it's only going to increase. Um, we're on the brink of the fifth industrial revolution. Um, I think we're going to see some exciting new innovations in the waste sector, waste to energy, um, agricultural, just radical resource um, ca uh, capacity and how we, how we deal with our resources, um, aquaculture, um, space travel. So I think EIA as a tool will need to deal with these rapid changes and ensure sustainable um, development going forward. Um, while dealing with these um, great new innovations that will happen very fast. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker for this session is Marilise Trutter, and she is going to talk to us about sharp toothed catfish and parasites associated. Good day, everyone. One of the aims of this study was to determine if there was a parasite 
diversity gradient to our South African populations of Clarius haripinus, or more commonly known as the barbel or catfish. So we looked at the latitudinal biodiversity gradient as well as the enemy release hypothesis and parasite spillback. Eight sampling localities were selected with the no native populations in the northern part of the country and then refused to enter the Great Fish River in the southern part of the country as our non-native populations. All fish collected from these localities were infected with at least one parasitic species, except for one individual in the Rich River that had no parasitic infection. All of these parasites were on known parasitic species or specialists of the catfish in its pan-African native distribution range. The colorful graph the in indicating the native um, localities in green, the transition to the non-native in yellow, and then the non-native populations in orange, indicate the number of taxa found at each of the sampling localities. The overlaying graph indicates that the, st the statistically high diversity found in the Pongola, Moy River, and Vol River compared to the diversity in the other populations, respectively. What the parasitic communities look like if we look at the photos in the bottom right, the first in image is a monogenian, which is a direct life cycle parasite, and this was the most frequently and abundant parasitic species encountered. It was followed by two nematode and two cestode species. Thereafter, in contrast, another monogenian, the right picture, was found less frequently and in very low abundances. And that was followed by a complex parasite, complex life cycle parasite, the trematode, Tilodelphus, that was the second most abundant parasite during this study. So in overall, a decreasing trend is evident from the highest parasite diversity in the northern populations, decreasing with an increasing latitude. This is support. Um, a decreasing trend is evident with the higher diversity in the northern populations and up to 50% fewer parasitic species in the, with an increasing latitude and the non-native parasitic non populations. This supports the latitudinal biodiversity gradient population hypothesis with a decreasing parasite diversity and an increasing latitude. It also supports the enemy release hypothesis with a decreasing parasitic diversity as we move away from the non-native regions. And then lastly, the presence of only known parasitic taxa of Clarus haripinus <laughs> means that no parasitic spillback occurred. Lastly, a comment on the parasitic community differences or rather a question, what are the drivers for these differences in the parasitic communities? Is it simply because there's not a suitable environment for these parasites to survive? Or are we as humans impacting or inflicting stresses into the environment, creating the increased presence of certain parasitic taxa or the most certain absence of that? Well, you have to tune in next year to find that out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? A last question from the crowd. Yes. <laughs> so, Marlies, it would appear that, that um, diversity decreases from the tropics down into the more temperate regions. Um, if we just look at the latitudes that you have um, over there, it, it, uh, it, it's more subtropics. Would you expect or are there any data to indicate that there are more parasites in catfish that we know occur higher up in the tropics? Okay, so it, um, from a recent checklist, there are about 120 parasitic taxa described from the catfish or that are native to the catfish. But n there are no studies that did a big compilation of a tropic site saying this is the number of species present and this is the diversity. So in a few months, I'm going up to Zambia near Congo and doing a population study, seeing what the parasite community looks like there. And then we'll know definitely, do we see this decrease over a broad latitudinal gradient? And I'm excited. <laughs> I think we're going to find interesting things there. Thank you. Okay, and that concludes our session on the speed talks. I just want to thank all the speakers for keeping within time. We are exactly on time. Did not have to use the trapdoor once. Thank you very much and have a good lunch.